Hello, my friends. Welcome to The Big Picture. Great to have you with us. Throughout this quarter, we're following a theme entitled Three Cosmic Messages. This week, our study is entitled A Moment of Destiny. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I come to you because I'm so conscious you are the one who controls our destiny. Lord, be with us as we open your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's one of those things that I really enjoy. Having opportunity to spend a few hours reading. The older I get, the more I find myself feeding this little addiction. Unfortunately, I do have a problematic habit. I have the habit of jumping to the last chapter to see where the author is going. Then I'll return to consider the argument. I'm told that this is not a good method, but in the non-fiction genre, I found it can save a lot of time. One thing I have found is this method doesn't work with the Bible. You see, the Bible is a library of 66 documents that's been compiled over a period of more than 1,500 years by a motley crew of people, farmers, fishermen, tax collectors, kings and priests. In the case of the Bible, the method I prefer is to follow the themes that are repetitiously developed. In this week's study, we pick up one of those themes. This theme is one of the most oft discussed in the entire New Testament. That theme concerns the second coming of Jesus Christ. Hence, our study is entitled A Moment of Destiny. This theme is a feature of every single New Testament book. It's presented repetitiously as the apex of all salvation history. And in the case of our current study, it gives both context and relevance to the cosmic messages of Revelation 14. Next week, we start looking at the relevance of the particular elements of Revelation 14. That's when things really get exciting. But this week, we jump into the climactic event of the New Testament. This week, our study commences as we dig into Revelation 14, 14 and 15. This case, in this case, the second coming of Jesus Christ is presented immediately after the three angels have spoken their God-given messages. You'd recall the passage. Jesus is described as the Son of Man, and he's pictured reaping the harvest of the earth. This is what the text says. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and having in his hand a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out of the temple, a crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What a context. This sets for the three angelic messages. Those messages are pictured being proclaimed to the entire earth. Then comes a command to reap the earth for the time of harvest has come. This is the command that the people of God have looked forward to since the day when Christ said to his apostles, I will come again. Why not chat about this in your discussion group? Perhaps you could ask these questions. What does this picture of the reaping of earth's harvest, say to you about the relevance of the messages that come immediately before. To what era are the three cosmic messages applicable? Compared to when you first believed, what changes have you noticed in our world that appear to say earth's history is about to climax? In your discussion of these questions, I have no doubt that many of you will have shared some of the almost unbelievable changes our world has seen in just the last two or three years. The signs scream, Christ is coming. Certainly, we are living in the climactic period of this world's history. As we now move to this week's Bible study, we see this theme repetitiously reinforced. It gives both context and and relevance 
to the three cosmic messages. So what are the most important aspects of this week's study? I suggest Sunday study is worth discussing. In this study, we commence by considering Christ's response to the disciples' inquiry concerning the end time. Christ climaxes his response in Matthew 24 by saying, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. In Revelation 14.6, the first angel has the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. Do you see it? Over the entire Christian dispensation, and there's been no change to the mission of the church. This, I believe, is a beautiful picture. The first century gospel commission is picked up in an end times context. Significantly, however, there's a subtle difference. When the Great Commission was first given, it was delivered to the disciples, and the disciples were empowered by the coming of the Holy Spirit. How quickly the message went to the whole then known world. In the picture painted in Revelation 14, it's an angel from heaven who's seen with the gospel message. This is a significant difference. Why not chat on this in your discussion group? Perhaps you could ask this question. Why do you think Revelation 14.6 provides the picture of an angel sharing the gospel message? What does this say about heaven's interest in the spread of the gospel? What does it say about the potential power of this message? Do you think we're seeing this power evidence today? Why? Oh, why not? As we come to Monday, we return to the key scriptural passage for this week in Revelation 14, 14 and 15. In this study, we see Jesus presented as the Son of Man. He's shown as the only one worthy to reap the harvest of the earth. On Tuesday, we discover that John's picture of Christ's coming in Revelation 14.14 is almost identical to the picture drawn by the prophet Daniel in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Daniel says this, I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. This is the climax of human history. It's painted by Daniel and repainted by John more than 600 years later. Christ receives kingdom, power and dominion. What a picture we've actually got here. As you conclude this week's study, can I encourage you to engage in one final discussion? We need to discuss the makeup of the kingdom that Christ will inherit. In short, what does it mean to be a subject of Christ's kingdom? This is the theme of our study on Wednesday. On this day, we're presented with a quote from the book Christ's Object Lessons. It uses agricultural imagery but I'm sure you'll understand what it says. The germination of seed of the gospel represents the beginning of the spiritual life and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible but continuous, so is the development in the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet if God's purpose is to be fulfilled in us, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. This statement is speaking of those who are crowned with Christ as his kingdom is established. Why not discuss what this is saying and perhaps more importantly, what it is not saying? Perhaps you could ask these questions. How do you understand this statement that at every stage of development, our life may be perfect? 
What does this mean, especially when we see our faults and defective characters? Is it possible to be perfect but not yet complete? Personally, I see this statement as one that has wonderful depth to it. Think about it. The believer is called to be perfect in Christ at every stage of life. Yet, as the Holy Spirit works, there's continual advancement. These are the ones who receive the victor's crown. These are the ones who stand before the throne. What a picture of all that is to come. Thank you so much for joining with us. If you'd like to contact us, we can be contacted at the address on your screen. May the Lord richly bless you. I'm really looking forward to you joining us next week. 